Hello and welcome to episode 84, where we get to look at and review the first Game Boy Advance revision, called the Game Boy SP. This handheld was an amazing leap forward, both in physical design and its functionality. So, I hope you'll enjoy watching this review, please remember to hit the like button, and I'd ask you to consider subscribing, if you've not done so already, and to follow us on this epic journey. The Game Boy Advance SP was first offered for sale February 14, 2003, initially boasting a frontlit screen and offered in an ultra-compact design. We saw this beautiful design further enhanced with an additional upgrade, a mere two years later, by receiving a far brighter, and much superior backlit screen, this was called the AGS-101. But before we look too deeply at the Game Boy Advance special version, I'd like to briefly look backwards to the last episode's photo quiz question, we hear on this channel call, what in the world? And I really tried to trip people up on this one, by using a black version of what is, a traditionally a solid white object. I actually wanted viewers to think this was a Wii U control pad, as that is what it most resembles with a cursory glance, but it was not that at all. It was in point of fact a simple Wii remote controller, albeit in satin black, and not shown in the familiar white that we're familiar with, it has the Wii Motion Plus device already inside its casing, so is a later upgraded model that came with a standard black Wii games console. The home button is actually very light blue, but it does appear almost white in the photograph. So were you right, or did I successfully trick you this time? A big shout out to all the viewers shown here who were definitely not fooled by me, you guys are simply amazing, and clearly you're all super knowledgeable to have nailed this one so well. I'd like to return to our star and focus from today, by running through the instructions booklet, that's actually just an info sheet enclosure. We start with a section on warnings and caution statements, ranging from things like a player having a seizure to a soft tissue injury from repetitive motion, and then there's the chemical hazards from toxic leaking batteries. So, after that segment, if your mom or dad still let you have the system, it zeroes into the more realistic and enjoyable stuff that's actually interesting, things like the amazing, laptop-like folding case design, that protects both the screen and control buttons from accidental wear and scratches, while looking awesome. It goes on to explain that the TFT color liquid crystal display screen was 2.9 inches across, and has an internal screen light, it's actually a front light, and this setup sadly allows the degradation and washout of colors quite a bit, but, honestly, no one was complaining at the time of its release. Powered by a fast 32-bit ARM processor, this console also received a built-in rechargeable lithium-ion battery that could last up to 18 hours of continuous gameplay, without the light function operating. Fully backwards compatible with every previous Game Boy pack or cartridge, this system was an instant hit. The overview of the game's components would be familiar to anyone who'd previously owned an earlier model Game Boy, as the Game Boy Advance SP resembles these earlier systems when it's opened out fully for playing. To really underscore the commonality between the Game Boy Advance SP, and say, the original brick-like DMG version, I've done a side-by-side -side comparison. Surprisingly the Game Boy Advance SP is nearly identical to the original Game Boy in both height and width, however in depth or thickness it is clearly far slimmer, and when it's folded up, it is, amazingly still thinner than the original. Section 4 covers the charging and maintenance of the internal battery, as this was a brand new concept at that time. Information included such details as the expected lifespan of the battery, which was identified as being 500 cycles, and the duration of play, with both the front light on and off being clearly explained. The fact this freed up parents from buying endless AA batteries, or perhaps escaping the chore of having the TV remote batteries being stolen on a regular basis might have also been included as a selling point. The cleverly designed and discrete power indicator light, situated on the lower half of the unit, to the upper right hand side, does not distract during gameplay, however once the red indicator light illuminates, it is best to stop playing at the earliest point, and save your game before recharging the battery. Section 5 briefly looks at the game packs, or cartridges, and how to properly care for them. I wish it had told me to save the game boxes and their inserts and keep it all together in a pristine package, but, I guess with hindsight and maturity we'd all do stuff different. The instructions go on to offer the correct insertion method for the game into the unit, as well as the advice to remove the game pack when the system is not in use. This was actually the opposite to what most of us did, as we all usually stored a game in the unit port to prevent dirt and dust getting into it. And sections 6 and 7 offer advice on how best to play the legacy Game Boy games, explaining that the screen can display the original or color games in their design format, or in an expanded landscape display, which actually fills the screen, but distorts the image. As with earlier revisions, the ability to add a color theme to games that had no predetermined palette was a nice touch. Head-to-head, -to -head, or multi-game playing, as an option, 
was still mostly achieved by the use of complicated and messy link cables. Although there was a wireless doggle available as an accessory for a certain limited number of games, we'd need to wait until the original DS for an internal wireless link-up capability. In an unprecedented move, way before Apple even thought of the idea, Nintendo decided to remove the earphone jack, listing their advice that an adapter was available as an approved accessory for extra cost, which would see the console using the charging port in a dual role. This still upset many of us as it rendered the earphones we already owned initially useless. Ratings are determined by the Entertainment Software Rating Board ESRB. The ESRB is a self-regulatory body that independently applies and enforces ratings, advertising guidelines, and any online privacy principles adopted by the industry. Apart from returning a set of Joy-Cons from my Nintendo Switch, for the dreaded drift problem, I've never had to take advantage of the warranty information, but it's reassuring to know you're covered when needed. So the Game Boy Advance SP sits in the middle of the 3 GBA designs, and for me is the most loved version, but each one has its strengths and merits. And this passion, or admiration is drawn mostly from the form factor and the dazzling array of themed variants produced across the world. Some like this Zelda version celebrates a popular Nintendo franchise, while others pay homage to earlier consoles that are nostalgically remembered, much like the Nintendo Entertainment System for example. And because of this, I'm going to divert a little attention into legacy designs, something Nintendo capitalizes on continuously. Firstly their use of iconic color schemes, for example the Nintendo Entertainment design was not actually used for the first time on the NES, if you search you'll find it was previously used on a game and watch, as seen here. The same can be said for the Japanese version, which is fondly known as the Famicom, or Family Computer. Its iconic design is nowadays instantly recognizable, but, surprisingly this pattern combination, was once again a color matchup that was initially used in the series from Game & Watch. And with the growth in popular in-house gaming franchises, Nintendo has themed many of its products with, for example, Pokemon versions, as well as Mario and many others. All of this is on top of the callback variants we've already looked at from their earliest home gaming consoles. But much of the success was to be found in the quality of actual games released, and that were made available for the advanced system. The content and graphics were not simply on par with earlier home gaming consoles, they were far superior. Nintendo being very Nintendo-like, they decided to push the envelope further still, they brought out a range of movie and TV show video packs or cartridges. These tiny videos held several hours of compressed, but highly enjoyable entertainment. These unique cartridges can be easily identified due to their gray color. These videos offer the thrill of mobile individual viewing of both cartoon shows and movies, while the world waited for the streaming revolution breakthrough to arrive. And while the SP was a direct successor to the original Game Boy Advance, sharing most of its internal components, its form factor owed much to another series of handhelds, that clamshell folding case actually debuted on an 80s game and watch, from the multi-screen series of games, with Donkey Kong shown here also offering the D-pad, or directional control for the very first time. Obvious parallels have been drawn a number of times with the later release of the Nintendo DS. The fact that the Game & Watch multiscreen series pioneered the folding clamshell design, that would be initially re-released and reutilized with the Game Boy Advance SP, should not go unnoticed. The SP would eventually go head-to-head, -head, with the Nintendo DS, but that's a story for another time. Then, in September 2005, without much fanfare, or a large advertising campaign, Nintendo resolved and remedied nearly every criticism I had with their initial SP model. They quietly rolled out a backlit version that only toggled between super bright, and an insanely bright lit screen. Identical in form factor, this variant is identified as the AGS101 model, the display literally became different as night is today. And regardless of which variant you actually owned, the task of protecting it, and your investment would usually loom large. It kinda of filled the role that perhaps nowadays is taken up by someone's cell phone, and just like looking after your latest iPhone, you'd want to protect it as best you could. I was lucky to own a Pelican leather soft kid case, this was a phenomenal cover that has been worth every cent I paid for it. It actually looked mature and sophisticated, which helped me as an adult user get less disproving looks. So a couple of things to finish up with that I find interesting. In a side-by-side -side comparison with the original Advance Game Boy, and the SP, you'll notice that the formers of the two, the original, has a screen which is heavily exposed, and flush with the game's casing, it was an obvious shortfall that would degrade over time with normal use. The SP however, is not only protected by the closing clamshell case, but it has a slightly recessed or sunken screen, that is additionally protected by the bezel and with it the five rubber covers that hide the screws on the screen's surround, with the top two being concave in design. 
I've noticed that the original Game Boy Advance buttons and controls have what I believe is a silicon membrane, which is rubberized and works with conductive pads, while the SP has tactile buttons, and clicky responses, I'm personally happy with both types, but the SP can be a little noisy, but not distracting. And I'll finish up with a montage of some of my collection. The Game Boy Advance remains one of my favorite handhelds, it's sleek and compact, has an amazing games library and is simply great for casual gaming. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, it's time now for our regular photo quiz challenge that we on our channel call What in the World? Today's photo is 100% official Nintendo, not a custom or third-party offering, so, do you know what this is? Please leave a comment in the section below, or join me next episode and all will be revealed. And lastly, please do me a huge favor by giving this episode a big thumbs up, and hitting that like button, if you've not already subscribed, I'd ask you ever so kindly, to please consider and do so, all your assistance is appreciated by our channel, but as always, most of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining me here today on the journey of all things Nintendo.